This podcast has mature language, not intended for underage viewers. Street Cred Sports. Street Cred Sports. Uh, I'm crossing over. I'm crossing over. I'm Euro stepping. Hello, this is Keenan of Street Cred Sports Training. And welcome to another episode of Time to Ball. This is episode 44. Chugging along as as I was once told, you're just chugging along, man. You just, you just every week, man, you putting it out. Yeah, I'm putting it out. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, I guess I should say uh, doing warm because <laughs> cause we went straight from, we went straight from 90 degree temperature to freezing temperature. So I'm trying to find that balance because I went from, trying to keep the air conditioners running well to damn I need to turn the heater on in the facility so I hope everybody's staying warm I mean some people like cold I know my wife says she professes to like the cold weather but she's like it's cold outside and I give her a look like but I thought you like cold weather so in any case <laughs> I hope everybody's doing all right well let me get into some things that interest me let me start off with a, a, a line and I hear it all the time in sports, but I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about it in basketball. Uh, I was watching uh, the what was it the Clippers and the Magic play last night, and after the first quarter, you know, had played, and the second quarter's coming, and announces like, you know, the the Orlando Magic were great defense stifling. They held the Clippers to first, uh, to 13 first quarter points, and then it got me to thinking. Well, was that good defense? Because from what I saw in that first quarter, and I was watching the game, wasn't like stifling defense. The Clippers and the Magic were both getting shots that they wanted, whether it was ball movement or whether it was the Stars, you know, breaking their defenders down, pull up jump shots, get into the paint. They were getting the shots they wanted. They were just missing shots. So I started to think, do do people overestimate or overrate that type of stuff? How how good a defense is? Now, if and I'm gonna use I'll use basketball terms. If defensively you're scheming against a team because you're trying to get a certain person that you know isn't good, you know whether it's shooting or driving or making decisions. If you're trying to put that pressure on that person, and that person keeps missing the shot or making bad passes, then I guess you could say, yeah, it was good defense because schematically they they were trying to put the ball in that person's hands. But if the best players on the team and the ball movement on the team is swinging and multiple guys are getting wide open shots, your best two players, Paul George, Kawhi Leonard, are getting to their spots for pull-up jump shots, Russell Westbrook get into the basket like he, you know, he is aggressively. The shots weren't just, they just weren't falling. They were off. It was a slow start for both teams. So is that really good defense or is it just that they just missed shots? So I, I really, you know, I really, I don't want to say hate. It really bothers me when, when I hear people say those things. You know, oh, well, great defense. But when you're really watching the game, no, it wasn't very. And it, it was it was weird because they're watching the game. And the announcers were saying it, you know, towards the, oh, another another missed shot. You know, they weren't saying, oh, that, look at look at that defense that they they struggled to get the shot off. They were taking bad shots. No, they were saying, you know what? These guys can't buy a shot right now. That's exactly what they said. Now, from the second quarter on, Clips turned it on, and they ended up really giving it to to the Magic, right? So if the defense was good in the first quarter, what happened to the defense to the other three quarters? It was just that they weren't making shots. So I really think I, I have noticed this since I've tried to do more and be more when I'm watching to see what's going on. I noticed that a lot of people who commentate are just reading stuff off of box scores never really paid as much attention, never really meant as much until I heard uh, a player saying, man, you know, 
y'all, you know, some of y'all, y'all do is y'all just, y'all read off box scores, stats. And that doesn't tell you the story of the game. That's what happened. But it didn't tell you why somebody was one for 14. You know, maybe that guy, you know, was hurting. Or maybe that guy wasn't getting the shots off that, that he or she wanted to. Or, or, or maybe the defense was doing something different which caused certain things. So it's it's weird when people just read stats and then they start talking about the game from those stats, but they didn't watch the game. So I, I, I don't know what y'all think. I don't know what y'all think, but for me, I guess you can read stats and say, hey, you know, they had this person. Because I do it too. I look at the stats and say, man, you know, he was you know, 4 four fifteen or 4 18 or something. But I don't turn around and say, you know, uh, they must have locked him up. You know, I, I have to see it. Now, if I see it and I see that he's taking bad shots and they're making things difficult, then I would say, yeah, they're, they're, hey, they were defending him well. They were scheming against him. But if you're getting your normal shots, your normal shot selection that you get in every game, you're just off. You're just off. So the, the thing with, with basketball that's unlike any other sport is the best defensive players – can't stop the best offensive player. You can make it tougher for him in some instances, but you're not going to stop a great offensive player from getting the shot that they want because that's what they do. So I, I'm not going to say I was disappointed. It was just kind of alarming that that the uh, the uh, and I and you know what I want to think. I I believe the feed that I was watching it on was Orlando. So maybe it was because he's an Orlando announcer. Maybe he was just kind of a homer. Uh, so let me move on to my next thing. Uh, this was some information that was given to me. So I wanted to share it to, uh, listeners. Uh, I, I saw a Facebook post and, and, and they were saying, they were talking about the new rule change for foul shots in, in high school. And what they were saying was, please tell all of your city league coaches and parents uh, to make sure they know about the rule changes. So the ones that don't know about sports aren't, you know, at the games yelling at the officials and scoreboard keepers about things that have changed. <laughs> and I thought it was funny, man. I thought it was really funny. But uh, the new rule change, and it comes from the N NFHC, National Federation of High Schools. Uh, they met back in April. I guess they meet annually. And uh, one of the rule changes that they they instituted, there were some other ones, but one that was, I think, pretty significant. As far as all I read, it could be another one. Somebody else might think it was something bigger than what I thought. But the, the rule change of now high schools in Texas will go to, uh, instead of one and one, which is okay. So for those who are not familiar, and I don't, want to beat a dead horse but if some of you are not familiar with file situations okay there are personal files and then there are team files okay so after you get a certain amount of team files the offensive team can now shoot free throws the old rule was after 17 files you got one and one one and one means you shoot the first free throw and if you make it then you you get a second free throw if you miss the first free throw, then play resumes, okay? Then after 10 team fouls, then you will go into double bonus, meaning that you got two shots, okay? Now, I just just lost my train of thought as far as one thing, but I'm going to move into the, the uh, other part of the new rules. The new rules state that five team fouls per quarter and you get double bonus so in other words if you you know if there are five team fouls committed in the first quarter the offensive team will now shoot uh two shots for that whole quarter second quarter comes you go back to zero now if you shoot if you you got to get five team fouls again and once you get those five team fouls then the offense shoots uh two free throws per quarter for that quarter. So that goes on, you know, first, second, third, fourth. So it resets. Now, if you go into overtime, I believe in uh, overtime, 
you continue what you had in the fourth quarter. So if you're already at five team fouls in the, in the fourth quarter and in, the, in the overtime, you don't have to reset it. You stay at that. OK, now that's the rules that the NBA go by. Now, I, I'm not going to be one that says, oh, they're just trying to mimic the NBA and they're just trying to do what the NBA is doing. Uh they set a precedent. They actually made a comment uh, or they made a statement that it was um, looking at the data. They were stating that uh, there were a lot of unnecessary uh, fouls uh, underneath the paint, meaning off of rebounding. Guys were being fouled excessively and it could lead to injuries and stuff like that. And it's because, you know, it takes so long for the team to be rewarded shooting fouls. Okay, so that's one interpretation. Now, I actually spoke to a coach on it, and the coach added that uh, also there was something with free throws in the one and one. And um, the way it was kind of explained, it kind of gave a picture of, you know, one and one free throw. If one person is going to box out, but the other person is just not as ready because they're thinking, you know, that either the person's going to make the first free throw or they're taking two shots, that person can be injured with the box out. So it was kind of an injury predict uh, prevention thing. And I never looked at it that way. But then you start to kind of go back and you, you know, you visualize and not like I have some computer chip in my head where I can go back. But I, I do remember times where seeing uh, people shoot one and one free throws in high school games where one of the people, you know, one of the players wasn't ready. And one player was. So when the shot goes off up, they're boxing out another player uh is the the deep the the offensive player is is not ready you know and i didn't see any injuries or anything but once that was explained to me i could kind of see that so uh these new rules take effect uh and you know with the season starting uh for girls the season starts this friday i believe and with boys it starts next friday uh just be aware of it because I can almost guarantee when I go to a game, I'm going to hear, what are they doing? That's only five team fouls. It's not one and one yet. <laughs> I can already hear it. And for the coaches that are listening to this, I'm sure y'all can already hear it in your head as well. So let's try to educate people. And even if we educate them, some are still going to scream and yell that, that the that the referees and the scoreboard keeper don't know what they're they're doing you hear that? we got a point put the point on the board and it's right after a foul and and the scoreboard has to wait for the referee to come in and talk and let them know what's going on so they're gonna get it because they need to know if the foul counts and the parents are already the scoreboard is is if you've never experienced it at some point you will all right, so <laughs> that's what's new uh, in the in the high school basketball. Okay, so I I think I need to start staying up to two in the morning because hell, we getting all this breaking news overnight. You know, a couple of days ago it was breaking news around twelve. I think it was around twelve my my time. I was trying to watch a movie and I get my my alert and I had my phone on the charge and I'm thinking, man, once I put my phone on the charge at night, I'm not supposed to hear any noise, but maybe it just made, had to make sure that I heard that it was breaking news. James Harden got traded to, uh, from, from Philly to, to the Clippers. Now I personally, it I personally don't see anything that it does other than having star power and people wanting to see, you know, what's it going to look like. I don't see it moving the needle for me because, you know, I think when Harden went to from um, OKC to, to Houston, his game changed. I, I felt like he was ruined because it was more, you know, hey, I'm going to get my shots up. I'm going to run it the way I want. I'm going to have he heavy usage. A lot like what you're, you're seeing with Luka right now. You know, high games, high usage, ball's always in his hand. He makes all the decisions. You know, and, and that's great. It's great for them stat-wise, but it, it creates, you know, uh, uh, no flow with the other players. Now, 
I'm not saying he's going to play like that there. He can't because he frankly going to have two other players that are probably better than him right now with, with Kawhi and Paul George. So that dynamic is going to be interesting to see who, what, how he's going to be. If he's more like the OKC when he was, you know, distributing, he took shots and stuff. That's the James Harden that I fell in love with. The Houston one, I was, I was like, man, I, I get it, but it's, you know, it's just weird. But they were successful. They almost got to an NBA final, but I think it was just the chemistry and everything and having those players around, similar to what Allen Iverson had in, in 2001 when he was the focal point. He had a few guys who could shoot here and there, but everybody else was just tough-minded guys who played D, you know, didn't have to have shots. So that that trade is interesting we'll see how it pans out you know these guys are getting up there in age and you have to worry about uh injuries so i don't really know per i really can't tell what it's gonna look like i still don't understand what what phoenix is gonna look like and hell we can't even tell because bradley bill has been been hurt i'm not laughing because he's hurt it's not i don't want you to think that i'm laughing because he's hurt it's just He's been injury prone throughout his career. So what made people think that he was going to come there and magically be, you know, this person who played a lot? Devin Booker has been out. He's been kind of in. He had been injury prone, but he's starting to miss a lot of games from injuries. He was missing some last year. KD um, hadn't he's had a history of injuries, but he didn't really sit out a lot. Uh, other than when he had the main injury uh, where he tore his Achilles and stuff. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see if you can get those guys healthy. And and that's what I want to see is I want to see guys healthy and play. The other breaking news was last night. <laughs> it was the Raiders firing Josh McDaniels. So, you know, I don't know what it is with the breaking news, but I mean, you, you, you're breaking the news at 11, 12, 1 in the morning. And, Everybody could see it coming, I guess, other than Josh McDaniels. You know, you just you just go with it and you just hope for the best. But uh, from what everybody was saying, players, you know, news pundits, people inside, that the Raiders are one of those very impatient uh, organizations. The dad used to be like that, and now his son is like that. You you're you're going to produce. You're you know you're going to do what you need us you're gonna do what we need you to do to be uh to be successful but the thing is you know josh mcdaniels had a year a coaching stint before and he wasn't successful so I, i'm not sure what made you think that and then you get him there and he gets rid of Derek carr Derek carr goes to the saints and it's starting to look you know he's starting to look good there shout out to to my baby because oh by the way Sunday dinner was very tasty this Sunday. <laughs> it just seemed to taste, the food tasted a little bit better because, you know, her Saints won. <laughs> it's weird. I'm not saying that the food tastes like crap when, when the Saints don't win. Her, her cooking is excellent. But I don't know. It was just something about the, the, the taste of the soup. It was like, it was like from overseas. <laughs> the ingredients were just the rarest of ingredients or something. I don't know, man. But back to what I was saying. Um, yeah, he, he gets rid of Derek Carr. He brings in Garoppolo, who he knew when he was with the with the Patriots. You bring in Devontae Adams, who wants to come there because of Carr. You get rid of Carr. You keep, you keep Garoppolo, who's injury prone. And hasn't had the success he had since taking uh, uh, San Francisco to the Super Bowl. And it's just a mess, a recipe for disaster. The one thing I will tell you, I watching, I didn't watch the game. And I, and I heard, you know, it's like, hey, man, you see, you see how Devontae Adams was, how upset he was. So I have happened, I happened to look at the uh, game footage. And the clip with him going to the sideline after after an offensive, uh, you know, they, they after they got out. Now, I don't know if it was right after a pass that was uh, thrown over him because that was what they showed. And then they showed him uh, on the sideline. I don't know if that's what precipitated it, but it was something that happened. And he was on the sideline and he had this look of just utter frustration and anger. 
And I've had that look where you're, you're really mad about something and you don't know how to fix it at that time. There's, it's like, it's nothing you can do to fix it. It's out of your control. Right. And you just have to try to navigate the best way you can out of that situation. So it was a helpless feeling that I had at that time. And, you know, and, after I calmed myself down, I figured out how to fix the situation. And that's kind of the look that he gave. And that's probably when it was like, okay, yeah, this is, this is done. This experiment is over. So they, uh, they clean house, you know, the GM, the GM's dog, <laughs> the head coach, the head coach's goldfish, everybody got fired. Uh, I think the offensive coordinator got, got it as well. So, you know, they were trying to get away from him and starting the scheme and stuff. So, okay, well, this is what we're going to have to do. What, what, but you got to take, damn, they fired me too. <laughs> so I guess I better get my stuff out, you know, and the dog don't want to get walked because the dog knows uh, if you got fired, I know they're going to fire me too. So yeah, they cleaning house and I don't know what they're going to do that, that organization has been a, a a mess since since the eighties. It's had some flashes of of being you know really good. I think when Gruden was there the first time was the last time uh, that they were uh, you know really good. They made it to the Super Bowl, but it's it's been a really really bad stretch. So I don't know what they're gonna get to turn it around. Hopefully they can. Okay, the last quick thing I want to talk about that's always on my mind. Can somebody tell me why pre prevent defenses exist? I mean, really, I do know. Now, I'm not a football aficionado. I'm around guys who play football. I watch a lot. I tend to feel like I have a, you know, a little bit of knowledge in it. Not not type of knowledge that I know schemes and 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 plays and stuff like that. But I don't understand prevent defenses, especially now, especially now in this day and age where teams can get hot really quickly because you are giving them certain throws where where plays are designed to get guys the ball in space. Now all the defender has to do is try to tackle him. But these guys are really good now with getting in space, knowing where that defender's coming on, and turning a five-yard catch to a 20-yard gain. I, I haven't – the only time I think I've seen a prevent defense work is if it was less than 20 seconds. The team needed a, a touchdown, and the kickoff, they got the kickoff – at their 15 or 20 yard line. That's probably the only time. I haven't seen it really work on 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 good on good quarterbacks and on average quarterbacks. When there's I say anything more than a minute. Hell, Kansas City and Buffalo traded uh uh final drives that were both like 30 and 40 seconds a few years ago, if I remember correctly. I don't, I don't think it was 30 and 40 seconds, but they were really quick. And I think Kansas City was able to tie the game up. Hell, it could have been 17 seconds left. And they made two plays, two or three plays, got got within uh, kicking distance, and kicked a field goal. So, prevent defense, I, I, I understand you're trying to keep everything in front. You're taking away the sidelines. You're making them use clock. They don't have timeouts. You know, they're going to make a mistake. You don't see it as much because teams seem to be practicing two-minute drills more often and teams' offenses are moving quickly. So teams are have adjusted and they understand how to get to their spot, give the ball to the referee, and get down. And with all of this trying to keep them off the sidelines, I'd be damned if I see teams constantly get to the out-of-bounds play I uh, got get to the out of bounds on, on throws. They don't catch it in the middle and run out of bounds. They find those soft spots in between uh, two cornerbacks, and it, whether it's the uh, the DB and the safety, ball is placed perfectly. He catches the ball right there, and he, then he's out of bounds. So, I you know, look, please educate me. Please show me film in instances where uh, prevent defenses work. 
Didn't work in the Super Bowl for Philly because they drove that ball down. And, 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 and the Cowboys are, are known for getting the ball with under two minutes left and just moving down the field like, like, like they're the only team that they look like they're just practicing. So I'd like to know and understand why. I mean, I know why, but I would like to know why you still use them. Because if you have a defense that's pretty much shut a team out the whole game, let that let that defense shut them out the rest of the game. You know what they're trying to do. You know that they know if they if they're trying to get up the field for a field goal, they're gonna try to, you know, dink and dunk and, and get some plays and maybe a big play. If they're trying to score, they gotta go down the field at some point. They're gonna try to dink and dunk until they get to like 30, 40, maybe the fit between the 40 and uh the 40 yard line of of, of the uh, defense. And then they're going to start taking their shots. If you know that, keep playing. If they can't stop your pass rush, you know, <laughs> let the pass rush go. So, but that's a rent, you know, and I, I I guess I probably shouldn't be renting because I don't know enough about that sport in, in the context of I know the sport. I've watched it, you know, kind of, kind of dabble it in a little. I understand you know, certain things. Now I don't get into the play calling. I understand routes and stuff. I understand, you know, what defense are trying to do. So I think I could sit down with somebody and and watch film and have a grasp and not sound like an idiot. But I would like for somebody to sit me down and say, Kay, you wrong. And here is why. And and please educate me. And I'll come back on here and say, Hey, back on episode 44, I was blasting this, but you know what? After being uh, con- consulted with by a, a, a football aficionado, I see what they're saying. But I'm gonna have to if I can see what they're saying. But then I'm gonna always pull up and say, "Well, why didn't it work in this instance? Why didn't it work in this instance?" You even see the the Jets uh, Wilson, who's been killed this year about how bad of a quarterback he is. He's getting comfortable in. <laughs> In the last second drives and driving the game, driving the team up for field goals and touchdowns. So I, I'm not, I, I need to know more. Okay, so I'm going to get into basketball ideology. All right, so my first thing that I want to talk about is how smart does your point guard need to be? That was an interesting question, and it's not something that I thought I would ask because you figure, you know, the point guard is I, I, okay. I don't, I don't mean to say that the other players are dumb, <laughs> but the the point guard is like the quarterback, right? He's got to call a play, so he has to know and have a feel of where everybody is, how the defense is playing, who's hot, how to get people the ball in spots, right? So you figure that that player needs to be you know, highly intelligent, I guess. I, I guess. I, I don't know. I, I've never really thought about this question. The reason I was thinking about it is because uh, I think it was the Spurs. And uh, the, the, the guy who's running the point uh, made an interesting decision. And then the announcer says, you know, he has to be smarter when he runs that, that, that play as a point guard. And I got to thinking, like, well, how smart does the point guard need to be? I, you know, it I, now what I would think it would be about is what type of point guard you have, right? If you have a point guard that's more of a scoring mentality, then his his IQ is going to be more about scoring first, right? Passing second. If your point guard is more of a pass point guard, they're going to be looking at how to set people up. Now, when you have that type of point guard who thinks pass first, I would tend to think that that point guard might be a little bit better uh, equipped than the scoring point guard because the passing point guard sees the floor in a different way, right? Sees the floor as how to try to get those players those the ball. So um, I don't know because I've never heard of a, oh, this guy is really dumb and he's running the point guard. I don't I've never heard that. Now I've I've seen some questionable decision making from from point guards and it I, I think what I've seen that is I think I've seen it more from guards who run the point guard but are kind of natural scorers, okay? 
I'll use an example. Steph Curry, great shooting point guard, can get to the basket, can score. Steph has made some very questionable <laughs> ball decision, passing decisions with some of his passes. I haven't seen him just make just the, well, no, I have, but in some occasions, instead of him just making the correct pass, the natural pass, he makes He's tried to make a flamboyant pass to that same person, right? And not that he's like, oh, I got to do this. But I think sometimes he doesn't see it from like way Chris Paul sees sometimes. Chris Paul will sometimes, you know, most of the time is going to make the, not the safe pass, but the basic pass. And the basic pass, a lot of times is just as good as the flashy pass. Because ultimately, you want the ball in that to get to the person you're trying to get it to. Uh, so, you know, you have some guards who, who pass, and they're point guards, and they pass, but they don't pass so much to set their teammates up. Sometimes it's like, well, I'm passing it to you because I couldn't get the shot. So guys like Luka and James Harden, they, they do get a lot of assists, but if you watch – when they pass, sometimes it's because I made this move, they collapse, I'm going up, I was going to do this move to to shoot, I can't, now I have to pass. Now, full disclosure, they know where the open spot is. So it's not like they're just going and say, oh my God, what do I do? Let me pass to him. That's not what I'm saying. They're hunting for the shot first, and when they don't get the shot, they make the pass. Okay, and and it's evident in at the timing of the pass. There, here's the difference: if you're driving and you're going, you're getting ready to go up, and as you go up, everybody's challenging the shot. You make that pass, then you it could be you know it looks more like you were drawing the defense towards you to pass to said player. Same spot, same position, same same play. You go up, you draw the defenders up, you jump in the air, show the ball up high. They jump to try to block it. You bring it down and under, like you're gonna do an up and under. Uh, you know, uh, God, I don't even know what the word is, the the term for that. Like an up and under uh, basketball move in the air, where you catch the ball and you, you know, you, you spin it off your hands to to get English. Uh, off the backboard, I have to look at it. I've never thought of what that term is. Okay, but in any case, most of you know what I'm talking about. When you go up, they jump. You go up under to try to finish. But when you try to finish, you realize maybe there's another defender there. You're not going to have the angle. Now you make that pass. Okay, so those are the same situation, but they're kind of different with how they were approached. All right. Now, having said that, the question remains. How smart does your point guard need to be? I think it I think it ultimately boils down to what you have your point guard doing. If your point guard is having to make multiple decisions uh within within the flow of the game, knowing who they 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 have to get the ball to, I think they need to really have a, a firm grasp of the offense and, and high IQ to make those decisions. If you're you have a guard that's like you just go, you know how to figure it out. We're gonna run it through you. You get your shots. If you don't get your shots, you obviously have to set your teammates up because it helps creates uh, driving lanes for you. You know that's I hate to say it, that that's kind of just playing ball within an offensive stru- structure. Doesn't mean that those players aren't any 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 less smart. It's really of their to me, they're playing more to that that person's strength. Okay, so I do feel like you're you're you need to have some intelligence to play the point guard position because you should know where to get the ball. I don't think I've ever seen somebody who played the point guard position that had no clue of what to do. I mean, everybody who's playing that position has an idea. You just some don't see things as fast and and as far ahead as others. You know, some kind of make bad decisions. So, but does that mean they're not smart? No, nah, you can be smart. Hell, hedge fund and, and billionaires are smart, but 
they sometimes make wrong decisions that cost them, you know, lots of money. So uh, I, I do, to answer, my answer to that question would be they do need to have some intelligence. How, how much intelligence? They don't have to have some kind of baccalaureate or, or PhD from the high prestigious, you know, uh, colleges out there, <laughs> schools to play the position. You just need to know how to play the position. All right, now I'm going to go next into catching catching the ball off a screen, foot placement. Now, the reason why I'm I'm bringing this up is because uh one of my kids, you know, he was going through his play, you know, was doing in season training, was going through play, and with him I've had him for so long, I I'm not always trying to teach him stuff. I'm I'm now going into things that he wants to do, whether it's just shooting, he's just trying to work on the speed. But he asked me, like, look, you know, with this play, I'm coming from here, I come up from there, and I'm catching the ball to shoot. And it feels slow. So I had him to do it a few times, and I looked at his footwork. And, yeah, it's, it was it was a lot of unnecessary and inefficient steps that he was taking as he was uh, gathering the ball. So I basically told him there were there were two ways uh, for your foot placement coming up. And what I tried to have him think about is, look, there's only like two or three different footworks that you normally need for shooting off the ball, where you're coming out, the catch and shoot, coming over the screen. These, no matter where you are, this still applies. So the first one I did was him coming off, uh, coming from the bottom, coming up to the around the three point line. Ball is being passed from uh, the wing, and it was just coming inside leg, right, left, catch and shoot. Okay, uh, what I told him because as we did it, you know, first parts he was doing it, but it was like he was catching it left and then right, left, right. So. What I told him is there's nothing wrong with that left. And then as you're, you're coming in the air, you're catching it right left. So it looks like three steps, but it's a little bit slower. And what you have to understand is, you know, where that defender's coming, if he's locking trail or if, if the defender is coming underneath to try to get to it. So you want to be able to get that ball, make take those steps, whether it's a hop or one, two, like your timing. And and that's something that I, I've noticed. A lot of kids don't understand the timing with their footwork. So we worked on on him catching it as he's catching it is right left in this instance. Okay, it was right left. So he was catching it. He saw how fast he was able to get settled and and take his shot. Right now, once he figured out that speed, then what I had to do was work with him on the in this instance since he's coming in his right left. I had him to work on his left foot because I told him when you're coming at that speed, if your feet aren't properly spaced about shoulder length apart or so, you're going to tilt to your left and it's going to affect your shot. So I had him obviously needed to be a little bit lower, but what I was telling him was step out a little bit wider than you normally step with your left foot. And that's going to give you the ultimate balance as you go up. Sure enough, got to it and it was, it was great. Now, does everything footwork wise work with every kid because of their footwork and how they do? No, you can do it differently. So then I showed him another one where as he was coming, it wasn't right, left. It was going to be left, right, but not a left and then right step. It was more of like a stop. So as he's coming over the screen, as he's catching He's planting his foot wider with his left foot, and then he's bringing his right foot, not in front, but more to him. Almost like a jump stop, but it's left, right. And it's like, think of it as like if you're sliding into second base, but you're taking that step a little bit harder to position yourself, and you're catching it right as, as you're touching down with your left, left, right, and you get to pull up. He liked both, but he really gravitated to the right-left. So this off-the-ball uh, drill 
uh, I believe is going to help him because anytime I've worked with him on something, when he comes back the next week and I asked him about it and he said, you know, it looked faster. He'll tell me like coaches will even compliment him, like, you know, that that was flawless. The footwork looked really good on that. You look faster catching that shot. So defenders who were on him before he's getting that shot off before, a little bit with more time. So I was happy to do that. And I just wanted to share it to you with you guys because you know I don't think about it I didn't think about it and it's like you know I wonder I wonder how important people are placing on foot placement and the reason why is because I'll have guys who can shoot I've worked with like a lot of top shooters here in the city and oftentimes they're they're really good shooting because they can shoot the ball right they, they're just really good at shooting the ball but when it starts to come to off the ball, right, you got to go through the screen, get your feet set. A lot of them were lazy with their footwork, and they were sometimes getting the shots off because they had, you know, really good uh, play designs. But when they started playing against elite defenders, they were struggling to get the shot off. So I had to show them how to get uh, better. I, I'm not going to say elite footwork. I'm just going to say uh, faster footwork to get into that shot. And then I had to have them have a counter for that defender who happened to get through because once you, you have to know that they're going to be somebody that gets through w with the screen or whatever play you're running. And you have to understand, which sometimes a lot of players don't. I got to know that if I catch the ball and the defenders there, what do I have available? So, you know, you often I often try to give them a quick little counter for it, whether it's a little pump fake bounce, one, two pull or pump fake bounce, you know, uh, sidestep or whatever it is. OK, and it just depends on the situation. But I think it's important for kids to have that. I really do. OK, so these last two things, uh, they kind of coincide with each other. Now, our teaching style is to teach guard skills to all all players we feel is very important to development so if i have a post player here's kind of how i design it Here, here's the way i feel the need is if there's a post player and let's say the post player is between 62 and 64 they're playing post in high school if they have any you know uh, thoughts or, or desires to play at the collegiate level, the 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 op the opportunity is not there as a post player. Now, can they play post at some smaller school if they're very athletic? Absolutely, but it's not a common practice. So somebody at that height needs to understand how to to guard on the perimeter, and they need to know how to to dribble the ball. I'm not saying they need to be Kyrie, but they need to be comfortable with handling the ball on the perimeter and, and being able to catch and shoot one dribble, pull, get to the basket right now, whether they develop counter moves and, and really sophisticated ball handling. I mean, that's just kind of how the player can evolve, but the thought is not to teach a player all of these, you know, fantastic moves. Uh, when you know that that player is not going to be able to execute them, number one. Number two, that player doesn't know how to execute them, right? So you got to make sure you're understanding that. If you have a high-level guard, obviously you can do it when when you and they feel time that, look, I'm having trouble, I'm getting here, but, you know, this defender's here and here. You let their game kind of dictate when you try to show them stuff. Of course, we show kids stuff as guards, but it's just to, to get their ball handling better and their ball control better. But we're always focusing on the needs of that player. So when we teach players, uh, whether they're guards or, or, or obviously they're guards, we're going to teach them how to be guards. If they're post players, we're teaching them guard play. We're not teaching them guard play because we want them to be the next, next Steph Curry or Kyrie. We're teaching them guard play because we know that if they start to see that their footwork is better, it's a hundred times better. Number one, their decision making can be better. Number two, if they can shoot, they're going to be able to shoot. Now, I'm going to take it a step further. If you have a person who's a post player that was a post player at first, but now 
that post player uh, hasn't continued to grow in height, that post player is not going to be able to play post in high school. So you have to try to make sure that when you get them, and we tell the kids, like, you know, what's their projected height? And unless I've had some parents say, oh, he's going to be 6'9". Okay, all right, so I'm going to be looking at a player who's 6'9". Now, if they get that tall, we're teaching them post as well as guard play. So now it makes them almost an unstoppable player if they can grasp it because they have to understand how to take advantage of uh, mismatches, right? The, if the person guarding them is a taller guy or a tall guy but slow-footed, you can take them out on perimeter and go by them. If they're shorter, you post them up and shoot over them like a chair, right? That's that's basic basketball, okay? But if a, if a kid is short and you know that kid is not going to be tall once they get to middle school and high school, you have to give them the ability to transition from a guard to a post player. Charles Barkley was six was five ten and grew to six five in one year. Charles Barkley was a backup point guard who moved to 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 the post position, right? Anthony Davis was was like five something and he grew tremendously to be as tall as he was. He was he was a guard. Okay, so that helped them. Now, you're gonna have a lot of people that say, hey, well, I was a post player in, in, in middle school and I had to play, I had to work on my guard skills because I couldn't, I knew I wasn't going to be a post player in high school. So that's why we work on this. Now, why am I bringing this up? Well, you know, I hear things, I hear things. And, you know, one of the things I've, I've heard and, and continue to hear is, oh, well, they're just over there teaching them all of these, you know, basketball guard stuff. And, that stuff, you know, they, they don't need to be working on that with them. Well, those people who say those things are narrow minded. What we're trying to do is assess the situation with those kids and give those kids the best chance we can. Right. We have to. Now, we can tell them what we think. And, and I always tell kids up front, you know, look, this is going to be hard. This is going to, you know, it's going to take some time or whatever, but if you work hard, you will get there. I've had kids show up and they're senior at the end of their senior year, five ten, you know, really big. And they play post and they want to go to a school. The school told them they have to play guard. And I've told them I'll do my best. I'll show you. You're going to have to put in a lot of work. I said, but it's going to be hard for you because you've only known one way and you're going to be playing against people who have played guard their whole life. You just don't wake up and, and become a, 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 a point guard as a post. It takes some time, right? Now, can there be a special circumstance? Absolutely. But far more times than not, you're going to struggle, right? So we, we, we let, the, let the kid know the kid want to try. We, we did what we can. We could. The, the kid showed some improvement, but the kid started to see how much of a struggle it was going to be. And, you know, elected to, you know, just continue on his own. But ultimately, you know, he didn't achieve his, his goal that he wanted. OK. Right now, we get situations where we're able to help that kid and it helps the team. Coaches say, hey, you know what? That's that's good work with that kid, man. That kid has actually allowed us to do more. That's all we're trying to do. But this notion that we're just trying to make uh, make kids who shouldn't be shooting or shouldn't be a, a point guard, um, showing them all this stuff. No, we're trying to give that kid a, a, an opportunity. Now, it leads into the next point, which is I've had a lot of victories, but I've had some very disappointment, very, you know, I've had disappointments as far as uh, uh, training and, and, and kids, you know, not making a team or, you know, such, some things like that. Uh, I put a lot of work in, into what I do to try to get these kids in. And I don't do it with the assumption of, well, you know, everybody's going to make it because there are tons of intangibles. And even in this instance, there was something that I kept trying to express that I felt that if they didn't do, they were going to have a hard time, which was you have to play. You have to have experience. I can teach you everything. 
that you need to be taught. But until you put it in actual play, seeing the speed of it, understand how to adjust to certain certain things, you can look like Kyrie, but play like uh, Byrie. <laughs> I'll just say that. I don't know. I hope there's nobody out there named Byrie that's taking offense to it. I just, it was just on the top of my head. But Byrie doesn't play like Kyrie, right? So you have to have an understanding and put that stuff in play. And I had a kid that came last year around this time because he got cut. And the kid was playing post player. And I immediately told him, I asked him, I said, are there other kids that are just as tall as you or taller? Yeah. I said, okay, so sometimes what happens, and this is, this is an ugly truth. Coaches will put you, and say you can't help us in out on a uh, boxing out because you you can't you know rebound as well guys are taller you know you're gonna have to handle the ball and play out more on the perimeter and they know that you can't do that and if you can't do that then it's going to be hard to make the team it's not it's not some oh that's awful that coaches do that that's life that's life. So when he explained it to me, I told him, I said, yeah, you know, it's, it, it's not some tactic that, oh, we're going to put them in It's Look, you can't, you can't out rebound all of these other guys. These guys are taller. They're going to kill you on the boards. So even if I put you at, at, at uh, in, in that position, if your footwork isn't good and you can't keep people off the boards, you can't help us on the team playing post. You're going to have to help us. Uh, on the perimeter and if you can't dribble or shoot we can't have you in because you're going to cause turnovers the the offense is going to be unproductive the defense is going to be unproductive because you can't guard faster guards it doesn't work right this is real world experiences so with the kid got the kid you know at the explanation you know i mean i had to had to conversation with them we began training it was it was rough at first because the kid didn't know how to do much of anything right but the kid kept at it I kept at it you know and the kid started to improve and it was like at some point I was like you know it usually took me half a training to get the kid to understand this now the kid's picking it up pretty pretty fast kid gets it only thing that the kid hasn't done that I've told them they need to is to get on the team right they were on one team there's no practice there's no I said look you can't waste time like this you need to be playing they get on another team is playing a little and then there's uh, the, the state of the city league and, and I have to dedicate an actual show to this because it's it's almost disgusting this the the city league uh culture here with with how I, I you know what I, let, let me let me phrase it I'm, I'm not going to use the word disgusting it's it's in a bad state because it for all accounts and I'm not at any of these games and I got numerous kids on numerous teams you know a lot of them say really great things about their teams a lot of them say a lot of bad things about how the team is ran and how it looks and stuff and it's not just from their standpoint they're a really good player on that team they get to do you know they're not kids that aren't allowed to play they just see how this team is ran differently than that team. Okay. Uh, it, it needs to be a fix, you know, and if, if, if it's going to be something that I got to do within the next uh, six months to a year, I'll, I'll get on it. I'll get on it. Cause I know how to change it. But in any case, that's a different conversation. The kid had to move from team to team. Then finally found a team that, you know, was settled on and was starting to play. And then I had to correct them. Like, look, you're playing exactly how you were playing when you were at this school. That's what got you cut. You're going to have to do more. You're going to have to play more. You got to show them more. Kids started to do it. Asked the kid about practice throughout the summer. Everything's going well. He's doing this. He's doing that. Now, obviously, there could be some things that the kid was thinking they were doing good and really weren't doing good. But I had my acceptance speech. I was ready to start, start the parade because they had practice and stuff. And, you know, they had practice. And I was like, anything you need to go over before you go for this tryout, right? You know, so we can work on it. The kid was like, no, nah, I'm confident. I feel like this and that, all the different players that are there. I think. I'm, I'm great. I'm, I mean, I'm great. I think I'm good. I'm, I don't have any concerns. 
So the kid comes back and says that they didn't make the team. And it bothered me because I put, I mean, I put, look, I don't want to make it sound like I put more time into this kid, you know, but I put a lot of time and effort into the training that I do with the kids. And would I say I have a 90 to 99% success rate with kids making a team and developing and being better? I could look, but I don't have a ton of kids coming back saying they didn't make the team. It's going to be one or two, and every school is different. And I think this kid could have played on probably 10 to 12 other teams in the city of El Paso for high school on JV, right? That's just my opinion. Now, I haven't seen the kid play, but I've seen some of these kids play in some of these other high schools on on JV, and I could think that this kid's skill set is a lot better than those kids, right? You have kids that are playing that don't have skill set or ball IQ, but they're on the team because it's all that's all that you know that they have. Okay, not nobody's fault. That's the situation it is, right? But in this situation, it bothered me, and I asked the kids step by step. Now, moral victory, I'm not for that, but I had to try to give the kids something to to look into and I look up for. And I said, look, last year you were cut the first, you were cut first round. You didn't even make it to the end. This year, you made it to the end, and it came down between you and one kid that they pulled one of you, according to him, they pulled him into the office, or they pulled the other kid in the office first, and then they pulled him in the office, and and so it was was a pick'em. I said, and that pick'em could have been anything. I said, so what you have to look at is the strides that you made this year with how much better you are. You're a lot better. Now, where you suffered from was that game experience. You didn't play a lot, so I don't know what happened when play. And I'm going to have a conversation with that coach. I'm going to have a conversation because it's stuff that I need to know, you know. And there, there was there was a comment that was made that was a little troubling, so I'm going to try to address that as well with that coach because you know I, I'm I'm not going to go there, but I'll, I'll address that. And look, do I think we're the greatest thing to the city of El Paso? Absolutely not. But you look at our resume and what we've done since we've been here and how we've grown and how we continue to grow. I'm not one to sit around here and toot my horn. I just think we're we're really trying to accomplish things. So if I tell coaches all the time, if there's a kid that we're training that's not doing well or if they're making mistakes, let me know. Because I I bust my ass to make sure that we're trying to help you with a product that you don't have to coach as well. And I will tell you this. I have coaches, quite a few, that will come and ask me, are you training such and such? And I'll say, no, they, uh, you know, they, they stopped coming. Uh, they needed to, they wanted to take a break. I think they're training with another person. And they say, yeah, I can tell. Because the minute, he's like, I can almost tell you to the day that they stopped training with you. Because the following week, when they started training with this person, they started doing all this crazy bullshit. You need to get them back over there with you. And I said, you know what? That's not what I do. They made the, they made a choice to go somewhere else for whatever reason. I don't think it was because they weren't learning. I don't think it was because they weren't uh, 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 liking what we did because, you know, they still shoot me messages asking for help and asking stuff. And I oblige them. I I still see them. And, you know, you're you're on social media and you like and stuff. So if the way it works, if they didn't like what I was doing, I would have been unfollowed or unfriended or, or, you know, cut ties with, and I wouldn't see any of their posts. Right. But I still see a lot of stuff. So I know that, you know, they still think highly of me. If I run into them, sometimes they say, hi, how you doing? And, and I say, hi. And I, you know, I'm always hoping they're doing good. I'm never one to think, feel like if you're not training with me, uh, you know, uh, I hope you, I wish you not to do well. And sometimes kids have to understand that they go somewhere and then they have to see that whatever it was that they thought they were getting was somewhere else. They find out that they're not. And they find out all the little key details that, that we work on, or I work on with them specifically. It meant something. So I've had coaches come there, but I just want to let you know, it bothers me when, 
something that I put a lot of time into didn't pan out. Now, does that kid still have an opportunity to play? Yeah. It probably won't be at that school because what I've told that kid and I've told other kids, you know, and, and, and coaches might, you know, some of you coaches might deny it, but it, the, the evidence is, is pretty there. A lot of times, if you don't like that person as a freshman, not like them, like you can't stand them, but if that person doesn't, if that person doesn't fit the type of player that you want, there is nothing that that kid can do to make that team. I'm a product of it. I've been a product of it on two occasions, right? Through middle school, seventh grade, did everything that I thought the coaches wanted. Coach cut, cut, still cut me. Kept everybody else on the team that couldn't do shit when I wasn't on the floor, right? Next year, I turned into a different player. Now that coach wasn't there, I made the team. High school, same thing. I wasn't a tall guard. That's why he didn't want me. Now, instead of telling me you're not going to play varsity when I was a freshman, allow me to play two, two and a half years and then me fig- figuring it out, which is shitty. And, and some coaches do it. Some coaches are still doing it. And I, th- I, think it, I, I think it's a travesty because not everybody's going to be able to play college ball. And I think if you're realistic with those kids, I'm realistic with my kids, my parents. I tell them that you might not be able to make it unless you can do A, B, and C. So I'm putting it out there. Like, I don't know. But if you can, if you can do these things and you can do them at a high level, you're going to give yourself chances. I have college coaches that have types of players. They won't recruit certain types of players that I tell them that, hey, man, this kid can play. Yeah, but he's not, you know, I need, okay, I get it. I understand that, and I, and I, I you know, I respect that. That's how you are. So I know it goes on. Could this kid play good city league, do some showcases, do some camps, maybe a, a college tryout? And, and, and uh, will himself into a, a kid that has an opportunity to play past high school? Absolutely. I know because I've had some kids that I've had to do that with. They didn't play Division I, but they got a chance to play college, right? They made a team, they played. So it bothers me. I, I'm sure you can hear it in, in my voice, uh, how it bothers me that, that that kid, I, I think I was, I think I was more upset than he was. And I had to hide it for that whole hour because I knew at the beginning and I knew like this was going to be the last training. I was like, look, if you want to continue, you let me know your plan. You know, the kid didn't even want to play basketball. And I was like, look, I'm not telling you this because I want to keep you here. You know, I'm telling you this because I do believe in you and I think that you can make a team. All right. So you figured out you have to take a few days to to uh think about it and, and see where you want to go I, I honestly don't think he's gonna try I don't I, I think he was just that much more devastated and which which hurt because look I've had a couple of kids that when they said they're not going to play basketball look you know what I realized coach uh I'm not gonna be able to play basketball I'm not good I've kind of, but all of told him like, yeah, you made the right decision, man. Cause you, you, you're not, you're not going to, you don't possess the skills necessary to, to compete on the level. And and it's hard. It, it feels bad to tell a kid that, but I'm trying to be real. I'm not saying, oh yeah, man, you stink. You're terrible. Who would think of letting you on their team? No, it was basically, yeah, man, you, you look, you're going to have a hard time because you're struggling with some basic stuff that I'm telling you. And at the age you're at right now, I have, you know, kids who are seven and eight that are, that can do these things. Right. So it's basically trying to let them understand. And then parents tell me, look, you know what? I appreciate you being honest. I think he knows it. He's happy now. And, and, you know, Hey, good luck. Anytime you need something, you can come by. You want to come by and get shots when I'm here, come on by and get shots. You can get shots up with me. Right. But that other stuff, oh yeah, that other stuff, that other stuff is is just not, it's not, it's not cool, man. It's not cool. So best believe within the next week, week to a month, a conversation will be made. Maybe I'll share the conversation without sharing anything as far as the kid, the school, the coaches, all of that stuff. But I, I'm going to get to the bottom of it because there were some things that I kid told me that I, I didn't appreciate. And... 
I've, I've, you know, I've prided myself on my reputation and everything. So yeah, I'm going to get, we're going to get to the bottom of that. All right. So I know I kind of rambled on and, and, and went passionate. I want to tell a story real quick. And the story is, okay, we're, we're trying to be frugal these days because inflation is so damn high. A half a pound of ground meat is about the, uh, the amount of a car payment. So we decided, you know what, let's, let's look around and see if you can get deals for stuff, right? So y'all know the Hawaiian rolls, the sweet ones. They, they taste sweet, the bread. I don't even know the name of the actual company that makes them, but they're Hawaiian rolls, okay? And our, our buns and rolls, so they're really good. So we actually were like, hey, let's get some, um, some Hawaiian rolls to make some, like, uh, chicken sliders, well, I thought we had to. Get, I thought we had to get the brand because they were Hawaiian rolls. No, these were knockoff Hawaiian rolls, right? They were, and, and they weren't. They weren't bad. They weren't bad. They were. They were okay. I mean, they. I don't think they were as good as the Hawaiian rolls. But if you had never tasted the original Hawaiian rolls, you'd be like, man, these, these rolls are really good, right? And it just kind of. La- I kind of laughed and I started thinking about it, like. You know, places like, and look, I can't fault them. I can't knock the hustle, but like places like Walmart, yo, like you got to be careful. <laughs> you got to be careful putting your stuff in the aisles, you know, to sell there because they'll make a generic brand of it <laughs> and sell it for cheaper than what you selling yours at. Right. And unless you just, you got clients who got uh, brand loyalty that they're going to buy your product, no matter how much it is, because it's yours. You got people like, well, shit, I can save three or four hundred dollars buying this one and it tastes almost as good let me let me get this so you always you always buy and if you go into the stores i'm sure you're gonna notice like you'll have um uh, uh, let, let me think of an example you'll have this brand of, of 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 chips and then you'll have like seven other brands of chips that are cheaper but they're the same type of chips but you know they're knockoffs Right. And they're cheaper. So they know what they're doing. Now, why did why is this funny? Because it it's like when you go, if you try to have your stuff made over in China, like your clothes or whatever, you got to worry. China's going to copyright your stuff in a simple way, change something and then say it was theirs. That happened with them in, in, in Jordan. They kind of tried to steal Nike or it was Jordan's brand and stuff and, and kind of make knockoff stuff. And he would, they weren't cool with that. It happened to me. It happened to me because there was a design that I had. Uh, it was a sonogram. And it was one of my first designs that, that I always liked. And a lot of people loved it. And it, what it was, it was a picture of a sonogram with a baby. And inside the sonogram, and it was a basketball in there. I might have to go ahead and redo that design. And the word says, what I was born to do. Right. So it always, you know, it's like, hey, you know, this baby already knows what they were going to do, which out of the wound, they came playing basketball. Right. Yeah, just, you know, a niche, niche, uh, a nostalgic type shirt. Well, <laughs> I had some guys at the time who were wearing these shirts because I was making them, you know, promoting my brand and gave them some of the players that I know. Cool. They were playing over in Mexico for the I think it was a Juarez team. It was one of the teams over there at the time. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, somebody's like, hey, man, that's cool that, you, that you're that selling your shirts over there in Mexico. And I was like, what are you talking about? I was like, man, the whole team over there wearing the shirt, the, the Sonogram shirt. I was like, what you mean the Sonogram shirt? I happened to get a, somebody happened to send me a picture of it. It was a low resolution, low grade knockoff of my shirt. But they liked it so much that they's like, hey, well, we don't have to pay this guy. We'll just take his design and put it on his shirt and it'll be ours. Like, what is he going to do? He's not going to come over here and, and take it from us. Now, from a brand standpoint, I was flattered because I think the only thing they did, if I'm not mistaken, I'll have to ask some, I have to ask the guy. I, I think they took the logo off. No, I think the I think the logo was still on it. They just made their own shirt. I'll I'll double check on that. But you know, it was like, well, 
I'm getting credit is grow. I'm looking at it like it's a good. I always try to look at the positive. Like, yeah, he stole my shirt, but he's going to wear it. And other people's going to be like, look, other people are going to see the shirt and want to buy it. That's kind of how I look at it. As opposed to let me get my attorney and let me go sue that team for, for copyright and uh, copyright infringement. But I, it just, it, uh, seeing the, the, the roles that weren't, the Hawaiian brand rolls, the the company that makes them, that started making them, but seeing that there was an uh you know another company that like a knockoff, I guess, or I don't know what you call it because is it a not is it considered a knockoff? I'm not sure, but in any case, like Great Value makes a ton of things. Great Value Frosted Flakes, you know, it's not Kellogg's, but if Kellogg's is like three dollars more, you go try those Great Fra- Great Value Frosted Flakes, and they might not be too bad. But in any case, you know, is 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 it is it flattery because they they're taking over, or is it just strategic? Like, oh, we're gonna make money off of off of your shit. <laughs> so, but I don't know if those they was. I have to think they were selling them over in Mexico because I'm I'm assuming if the team is buying them, the people that go like, hey, we like those shirts, buy. Them. So they probably made you know a little money off of it, but. Uh, no, nah, that's just that that Hawaiian roll thing just brought me brought that back to me. So I just wanted to share that to you with you guys. Um, uh, I'm gonna have some bonus content. It's gonna be a short uh, discussion. I'm gonna talk about uh the joy and pain of, of families for NFL quarterbacks, and I'm gonna talk about my basketball ideology. I'm gonna talk about uh, rankings high school rankings to be exact, but you know, it kind of goes to rankings in, in, in general. So that is all for today. I hope everybody uh, continues to have uh, great success in whatever they're doing. And uh, just always know if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. I'm out. Street cred sports, say it with your chest. Yeah, yeah. Go get it from the net. Street Crash Sports, okay, that's a bet.